And so the way I describe wonder is it's an emotional experience that starts with openness, moves into curiosity, absorption, and awe. People who seem to hold their world with a great sense of wonder seem to be more resilient. They're more buoyant. It helps us want to move forward. From To Be Magnetic, this is The Expanded Podcast with your host, Lacey Phillips. And your host, Jessica Gill. As the leading destination for neural manifestation, we dispel the woo-woo in order to help you create real, tangible results based on neuroplasticity, psychology, epigenetics, and energetics. Our goal is to normalize the practice of manifestation and empower you to get into the driver's seat of your life in order to manifest the experiences, relationships, and things that most align with your authenticity. Part of our manifestation process entails expanding past your limiting subconscious beliefs. Therefore, by tuning into this podcast with interviews from experts, thought leaders, spiritual teachers, scientists, and those with neural manifestation success stories, you're starting the process of expanding your subconscious in order to see to believe that anything you desire is possible. And by pressing play, the process begins. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Expanded. Jessica here. So one of the themes we have coming up for you guys is this transitional period, whether that's a rock bottom, it's an up level, you're moving through a rut. And I think one of the ways that we can navigate going through these big transition periods is to see the opportunities on the other side. Instead of staring at a corner, wondering why that corner won't change, it's opening up your eyes to other possibilities in the world. And today's episode is going to be a beautiful glimpse into the magic of the emotion of wonder. We have on Monica C. Parker, who is a behavior nerd and the founder of Hatch Analytics, which is a world-renowned consulting agency whose corporate clients include the likes of Google, Lego, LinkedIn, and many other Fortune 500 companies. Parker is an author, speaker, designer, CEO, activist, clown, opera singer, and had his early career as a homicide investigator. And most recently, she has dove into the research and the power behind the emotional state of wonder, how it is crucial for better relationships, deeper creativity, empathetic leaderships, the basic joys of life and well-being, and also, fun fact, massive for expansion. Her recent book, The Power of Wonder, The Extraordinary Emotion That Will Change the Way You Live, Learn, and Lead, is a multidisciplinary journey through psychology, neuroscience, philosophy, literature, business, and shares some surprising secrets behind the mechanisms of wonder and guides you into incorporating more of it into your life. When I tell you I was excited to interview Monica on this topic, my mind kind of exploded understanding the correlation between the moments we have of awe and wonder in the world and how that actually helps our neuroplasticity be open to expansion. Essentially, wonder is the emotional state that primes us to be more expanded in life. It allows us to see opportunities that might not be there, take presence where we need to, expand time, which is a concept that she talks about in the book and we talk about in the episode, and really gives us an opportunity to evaluate the places our lives may be missing wonder and why it's so important to connect with this emotion that we kind of save for these big life moments, a vacation, witnessing the Grand Canyon when a child's born, but how incorporating it in our daily life actually impacts our entire biological system and our capacity to create new neural pathways towards expansion and expand our mind overall. This is a really, really powerful episode that's going to open your minds to being in a state of wonder, not just in those big moments of life, but in the little day-to-day ones, how we can prime our mind for wonder, for openness, for awe-inspiring experiences, and the incredible impact that has on us. So if you want to expand your expansion or your capability for expansion, this is the episode for you. And now a word from our partners. 
Lacey here, quickly interrupting this episode to chat through Bond Charge, formerly Blue Blocks. My favorite product that I think must be one of their most affordable is their blue light blocking clip light. I use it most because, again, our house is mostly candlelight after dusk, and I have to read Teddy books at night before bed, and it was really, really getting challenging just by candlelight. I'm like, how did people do this back in, you know, the 16th, 17th century? And so I use this. I'll just clip it right onto her little books for nighttime reading. And it's really special to watch because you can see her even yawning and tired. So for Teddy to have this protection, obviously we don't do screens with her at all. So she's not seeing any type of blue light and screens. Most of the things in her life are mitigated. It's really, really wonderful to watch that she is a complete circadian rhythm baby. She wakes up with the sunrise and she goes to sleep at the sunset. And I really, really love watching when we're reading at night her little books. We do three little books every single night while we nurse before she goes to sleep. I clip this on the little book and you can just see her yawning and getting tired. It's not interfering with her natural melatonin uptake. And then she sleeps really peacefully and beautifully through the night. So this is just my hot tip for parents out there who also read at night, who are really wanting to mitigate the blue light in their home that their child or children are receiving beyond just yourself so that their body can cleanse and repair as it's meant to do in the evening. So this is just my really favorite thing I like to share with other parents out there. It's the blue light blocking clip light. And make sure to use the code, all caps, MAGNETIC, M-A-G-N-E-T-I-C, for 15% off any purchase. That's all caps, M-A-G-N-E-T-I-C, with Bond Charge. If you're not familiar with Byte, they are an incredible company that I think is really, really becoming a game changer in the grooming space. Their product that's really blown me away the most is the toothpaste bites, which is amazing because they come in a glass jar and then they send you the refills in a completely compostable packaging that is zero waste. On top of that, what makes this toothpaste really special is that they have the option of a fluoride, which is an all natural fluoride or a completely fluoride free version. They also use a mineral that is proven to strengthen and restore our white teeth. I also really appreciate that I think they've really cornered the market and the fact that the bite toothpaste only has the actual ingredients you need to brush your teeth. None of the fillers or the things to add texture. Many toothpastes have a ton of extra ingredients in order to just create that paste that is completely unneeded in order to stabilize the water in a squeeze. So if you remove the water and make these little pellets, you can remove all toxic and unneeded ingredients, which to me is brilliant. And that's also why I really appreciate Bites deodorant because they have an unscented version. So somebody who's been on the bean protocol like myself for the last three years to have that option is really rare, especially in the grooming space. And again, it's something that is refillable. It comes in a really fantastic case. A lot of the other less waste deodorants I've tried, they tend to fall apart really quickly, or you have to carry a jar around and use your fingers, et cetera, which is fine. However, I really appreciate what they've put into this packaging that you can continue to reuse, 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 reuse. So if you would like to check out Byte, go ahead and use the code, all caps, TBM for 20% off. And again, that's all caps, TBM for 20% off. All right, on to the episode. Monica C. Parker, welcome to the Expanded Podcast. We are are so excited to have you today. I personally have been really geeking out about your work and your new book that's out all about wonder and the science behind it. And I'm just really interested in this field of research in general. I think it's really fascinating. And, you know, tying it all back into Expanded really is the thing that helps us expand and open our minds to see that new things are possible. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me and with that lovely introduction. I'm um, I'm blushing a little bit, but yeah, I I look forward to the chat we're going to have. 
Yes, absolutely. So one question we like to ask all of our guests is what is your cultural background and upbringing? So just give a little context to help expand others who may identify as a similar background too. Absolutely. I was born and raised in Atlanta. So I'm a, I'm a Georgia peach, a Southern girl, basically a very privileged background, very lucky to get a great education for my parents who both worked really hard. But then really it, pretty much as quickly as I could when I hit my 30s, I, I moved overseas to Europe to get my graduate degree. And now I've sort of toggled back and forth between the US and UK and, and France. So I, I think I have a global perspective, but at the end of the day, I will always have a little bit of a Southern twang and I'll always love my mama. So I'll, that's sort of where my roots will always be is in Atlanta. Oh, love that. And tell us a little bit about, I'm so fascinated too, like your background and sort of list of things that you've done and been exposed to and and tapped into is just all over. It's so cool. Tell us a little bit about Hatch and how, you know, your work there kind of inspired this journey and understanding why wonder, why this emotion do we want to dive into? Absolutely. So Hatch is a human analytics and change consultancy, and we specialize in the future of work. Really, our mission is what we say is better work, better world. So we will do anything that we can to help make people's work lives better. We are advocates for better work lives and for workers in general to have better lives. And we believe that that has a knock-on effect to the community, to our families, and eventually to the world, that if people are more satisfied and engaged and happy and fulfilled filled in the work that they do, that that creates better communities in a better world. And through the work that we do, because a lot of it is around change management, and we're helping people manage big existential change, you know, lots of layoffs or mergers and acquisitions, things that are out of other people's control, and helping them understand how to, to manage that change. And what I learned through that and also my background before that is that people who seem to hold their world with a great sense of wonder seem to be more resilient. They're more buoyant. They're just better able to deal with everything. And, you know, having that openness, that curiosity, that willingness to find the magic in a situation that we can't control just really got me interested in wonder. And I went down a rabbit hole and came back out and wrote a book. <laughs> Amazing. It's so interesting because when you're you're thinking of exploring and researching different emotional states, you know, happiness comes to mind. How do I find happiness? I want to manifest happiness. And I really love what you said in the book too, is just, A, we're really bad at predicting what makes us happy because we have so much cultural and societal programming around us of what we're supposed to feel happy by. But also happiness is a very fleeting emotion and doesn't give us that fulfillment of a spectrum of emotions, which actually gives us more fulfillment. I mean, it's fascinating and I'm not anti-happiness, you know, I, I appreciate it. And I think that by following wonder and trying to seek wonder, we often will find happiness. But the challenge with happiness, as you said, Jessica, it's not, we're so bad at finding it. We're bad at understanding this idea of what's called affective forecasting. So we're really bad at, at forecasting what it is that will give us that positive affect, that happiness. And frequently, as you mentioned, is so caught up in consumerism and hedonic happiness and that, you know, quick fix, that boost that we get. And even if we get into more eudaimonic happiness, which is more meaningful, given the, the slings and arrows of day-to-day -day life, it's not a sustainable state. You know, it's hard to be happy when, you know, you're in a car accident. It's hard to be happy when there's a war in the world. It's hard to be happy when you see the, the COVID numbers, you know, increasing. But what you can be in those points is you can still be in wonder. And what the research shows is that emotions like wonder allow us to have both positive and negative emotions, sometimes even at the same time. And people who are able to hold these almost competing emotions um, at the same time are really much more resilient. They're much more able to move through the world in a positive way and more likely to find happiness at the appropriate points in their life. Yeah, I love I love what you said too. Like happiness is a self-focused pursuit, whereas wonder is the transcendent, the connection of all of us. Talk a little bit about when we think of wonder, I can imagine people's brains are like, okay, wonder, is that magic? Is that awe? Is that, you know, I saw the Grand Canyon. You know, what are some tent poles of how you sort of define wonder? And I know we have the five elements that we'll get into too, but how do you sort of paint a picture for everyone out there? 
Wonder is a bit of a shapeshifter as a word, right? We have wonder as the verb to wonder, but then we also have wonder as a noun to experience a wonder. And so the way I describe wonder is it's an emotional experience that starts with openness, moves into curiosity, absorption, and awe. And so at each one of these steps, we have an opportunity to experience the fullness of this emotion and this emotional experience. But what we find is that It can be the big moments, those giant ah ahas, like seeing the Grand Canyon for the first time or the birth of a child. But what I find most exciting is the research that shows that we can find it in the quotidian. It can just be these small day-to-day things that that give us that sense of oneness with the world. So it can be a sunset. It can be seeing just the smallest, most perfect autumn leaf that falls down. You know, it can be these little moments that we notice, but the key is that we have to notice them. And so, so often in our life, we need the big moments of wonder to smack us across the face to notice them when really we have the opportunity to find them in our everyday life if we would just slow down and be more present to allow ourselves to see them. I think too, you know, this day and age where you had a section on boredom and like allow yourself to be bored. It's okay to be bored. We don't have to have these automatic responses of I'm bored, check my phone. I can be doing this. I can multitask. Multitasking feels good to be doing because you're hitting all these, you know, different dopamine checkpoints. But in a day and in a culture that we are so ingrained to not be present, what are some of the ways that even you found able to cultivate this is where I have the opportunity to either zone out or dip in. I will say that, and I I sort of say it at the end of the book, I am not a wonder Jedi master. I am still on this journey with everyone else who picks up this book. But one of the things that I have found most difficult, but also most rewarding is limiting the time that I spend on my phone. I mean, I do love my phone for a period of my life. It almost never left my hand, but I am allowing myself to have that sort of uncomfortable little crawling feeling of, I want to pick it up. Oh, I want to be distracted. I don't want this feeling. And then to just marinate it and allow myself to feel that. And then all of a sudden you start to notice everything else. You start to notice the sounds around you. You start to notice even things you didn't see before. And in that is the real opportunity to experience wonder in day-to-day life. So for me, that's been one of the greatest ways to be present. Another way is really just to focus on your five senses. I think we're almost overly stimulated in the visual context. You know, we've got now ads that are constantly moving. We have, we can watch anything on our phone. And I think that there's an opportunity to connect more deeply in an oral sense, in an audio sense, and also other senses like even smell in order to to try to step away from the onslaught of the the visual stimuli that we're always seeing. Yeah, I, I think it was on the Huberman podcast, but he had mentioned how it's like so important for screen time to just even go outside and see a vast horizon, which can inspire that awe-inspiring wonder moment. And even for your eyes to be able to see that difference from a screen to a vista or you know a, a long-term plane or something makes a huge difference. Absolutely. As humans, we're really not, from an evolutionary point of view, not meant to be seeing things at, you know, only a few inches or a foot away. We're meant to be surveying sort of large uh, amounts of of space and, and analyzing all of that information. And so I think that that is really helpful. Nature for a lot of people is a wonder bringer. For me, I tend to be more cognitive in my wonder bringers. I'm sort of a nerd. So I like intellectual wonder bringers, and that can sometimes be tough for me because I want to go down these, you know, these Google rabbit holes. And so I have to step back and allow myself to, to be more in the moment and to see everything that is around me. I definitely resonate with that. I had a wonder moment reading your book. <laughs> I'm going down the rabbit hole. I was like, oh my gosh. It's just that, yeah, exactly the wonder experience where you have the moment of, oh, this is what I thought of the world. Now I'm I'm recognizing this new sort of schema or this new way of thinking of things, I can register it differently. And wow, okay, if that means that, oh my gosh, I'm expanded. This mind is more vast and larger than I thought it was before. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I love how you say that. It really is about connecting the dots. And, you know, we talk in the book about this idea of people who have a high need for cognition, who really love having that level of curiosity, love connecting the dots and see the patterns and see the opportunity to sort of follow those patterns to a new way of thinking. I think that our ability to do that and the more we practice it, the better we get at it. Absolutely. And then that allows us to always be adding to our schema and changing the way that we meet and move through the world. Okay. So what are some of the benefits? So I had listed some out from the book, but more creative, more student of the world, humble, less materialistic, more generous, better community members. What are some other ones in there too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you hit a lot of the great ones. It it makes us better friends. People who are higher in the composite elements of wonder um, perform better in school and in work. As you mentioned, I, I love the elements around more humble and more materialistic. And in fact, people's friends found them more humble. So, I mean, this is something that we that you radiate outward when you become a wonder seeker. Um, but what I find really fascinating is the physiological impacts as well. Evidence showing that people who experience wonder have lower blood pressure, they have lower stress hormones, and they have lower pro-inflammatory cytokines. So pro-inflammatory cytokines are the proteins that get triggered when we're ill and they help us make us better. But of course, when they're triggered, if we're not ill from, say, stress, then that actually will lead to us being sick. And the types of sicknesses that are associated with pro-inflammatory cytokines are things like cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's. And there's a lot of evidence that shows that there's a direct biological pathway between people who have more wonder in their life and then better health. And so that to me is just really, you know, remarkable and really exciting, very exciting to me. I think, too, this idea that it is shifting from that insular experience to a more universal one. You know, when I think of times of great wonder in my life, it does feel transcendental. You re- you realize, like, everything is beyond this lifetime, this limited belief that I have clouded beneath me or this myopic viewpoint of how I feel about my life in this moment. I'm like, Oh, it's so much bigger than this. And it's interesting because when you try to describe the feeling of it, it's so beyond words. It it is ineffable. That is exactly Mm -hmm. what it is. It is ineffable and it, it defies explanation. And yet everyone has felt it. It is universal. And so it's sort of, well, we know it when we feel it. And that level of connectedness and that idea that there is more, I think if there was any one message that I want people to take away is that there, there is more, there's so much untapped, unseen that we get glimpses of when we allow ourselves to connect with wonder. And I think that the more that we do that and the more that we embrace being a wonder seeker, then we are able to sort of pull that veil back and see what is beyond our our just our present conception of of reality. Yeah. One of the the elements, you know, is watch and that's really the openness, you know, being able to be open to the experience to allow space to daydream and lean into that. Talk a little bit about I took the the test in there, the five uh what is it, the big five yep. test and I was very high for openness. <laughs> but for someone who may not identify with being very open, someone who's very rigid. I think about, you know, even like older generations who had a very, you know, they had a lot of fight or flight. There was like, we need to survive. It's all about that. I don't have space to think about wonder. I think about my grandparents' generation being like therapy. Like we don't have time for therapy. Like we were in a war. What are you talking about? Like that's not on the table. So people who might have less ability for openness. And I'm curious your thoughts also on openness with trauma and if their high levels of trauma equals, you know, their body doesn't physically feel safe to be open as well. So a couple of things, openness to experience is a personality trait and personality traits are developed pretty much 50, 50 by nature and nurture. So the two people who created us, who were our biological parents contribute about half of it. And then the other half is from our upbringing and the people that surround us during that period up to about the age of 20. So by the time we're fully grown adults, 20, 25, our 
our personality is pretty well set. It's not to say it can't change. There are ways to change it. But one of the things that I want people to feel is that even if you do find that you are a little bit lower in openness, no one is devoid of any openness. And there are ways that we can enhance that, can support a greater degree of openness. One of the primary ways is just to do the same things that someone who is naturally open to experience would be. And one of the key elements that when we talk about being open, we're not talking about being extroverted or bubbly. This isn't someone who's very comfortable going to a dinner party and introducing themselves around. That's not the kind of openness we're talking about. It's really openness to ideas, the willingness to recognize that your concept of the world is going to be different from others and being really interested and desirous of understanding other people's perspective. And so I think that your point about trauma is a really interesting one. The challenge is absolutely that when people have had trauma, either during the development of their personality or even afterwards, if that trauma is significant enough to create PTSD, what can happen is that people naturally retreat. And that's actually even what the pro-inflammatory cytokines do, is that when they're triggered, they tend to make us want to retreat in order to heal. And so we do close off some of our openness. But what wonder does is it helps us want to move forward. It helps us want to step into space with other people. And there has been some incredible research around the impact of wonder on PTSD is that it really helps people to reroute their neural pathways away from the trauma and towards more adaptive functioning. And in that adaptive functioning to move forward, being more open to other people, to experiences with other people and to new ideas. And so it, it is a very powerful mechanism for supporting openness. And this is one of the things as well in the book that you see, a lot of these sort of additive cyclical elements that openness makes you more prone to experience curiosity and awe, but then when you experience curiosity and awe, it makes you more open. And so you really just sort of have to get on the train. And once you get on the train and say, I'm going to behave as if I'm open today, that creates all these opportunities for curiosity, for absorption, for awe, that in turn will start to help you manifest future opportunities for openness to experience, openness to ideas, curiosity, and so on. And so it really becomes this additive cyclical process that I think can be really positive, but you just got to take the leap and, and get on get on the wonder train. A hundred percent. And it's so funny because I think about, you know, one of our pillars of manifestation is that expansion piece and feeling like, okay, now I see to believe it's possible for me, but I'll have, we'll have people write in and be like, oh, I don't have any expanders around me. I can't find them. You know, I'm in a small town, et cetera. To me, that signals their openness is not very wide ranging. Yes. They're not seeing the opportunities and the people and the connections and the potential actions that they could take that might help align them with their goals. And so I think in pursuit of this openness actually helps us manifest more and and more efficiently because we're now seeing the world through instead of, oh, I can't have this job that I want. I don't know anyone around me who's like that. Instead of seeing every single person around you as an opportunity to learn something, now think of that mindset and how much closer that person's going to be to whatever their goal is. You hit the nail on the head. I think of so somebody that's in a small town. What happens in that environment is you just start, you believe that you've seen everything there is to see in that and the, there's not enough novelty anymore. You know, one of the things we talk about in the book is that we only notice difference. We only notice change, right? And so if you're in the same environment doing the same thing with the same people, what ends up happening is you just stop seeing them. They sort of become part of the wallpaper and they're not really, you don't recognize who they are in totality. You don't recognize the opportunities that exist in your own world. And so one of the things we have to do is really train ourselves to see the novelty even in environments that we think we know everything about because there's no way we can know everything. We can't know everything about other people. We don't know everything about the environments we're in. So it's really about finding those elements that we ignored before and allowing ourselves to see that actually, no, it's not the landscape I thought it was. It's it's different. It's richer. There's more here. And in that, I think, is a, is a big opportunity. 
Absolutely. I think too, in, in partnerships, you know, in marriages and sustaining marriages and, and thinking about that novelty being a big piece of it, but part of the lack of novelty, yes, you know, a person on a very deep level, especially after 10, 20, 30, 40 years, but there is still semblance of new novelty because you're both evolving people. You're learning new things. You're taking in new parts of the environment. And so it's the task to find the novelty with the partner that you may be with for a very long time too. There was a chapter that didn't make it in the book because it's already 400 pages, but it is something that we're offering to people um, as a bonus when they pre-order. And it's about relationships specifically and compatibility. And one of the things that I think is an interesting way to engage in wonder in your life is to use it almost like a love language. So if you start talking to your partner using the language of wonder and say, this is a wonder bringer for me, I find wonder in this particular activity or an environment, what that starts saying is that you are expressing something that is deep and meaningful that has gravitas to you and you're opening the door for them to share that with you as well and frequently people haven't had that level of conversation they may say oh I like going to concerts but is it is it a true wonder bringer for you and if that's the case then you start to go oh well well why is that is it the being with other people is it the music is the artistry why and then you start having conversations that are are just fundamentally different different. They're richer, they're more meaningful. And I think it allows you to connect in a way that perhaps you hadn't before. So funny, as you're saying this, I'm thinking this past weekend, I was like celebrating my birthday. And initially, we had planned to go out to dinner with friends. And I got this kind of gut feeling the night before I was like, this does not bring me wonder. This dinner is the restaurant we've been to many times with the group of friends we've been to many times. I love them all. But I want something sort of to break me out of that to celebrate my birthday. I want a wonder moment for my birthday. And it it came to my mind. I was like, I love going to the movies. Something about a compelling movie is is super wonder inducing. And so I canceled the reservation. I was like, guys, we're going to the movies. Strap (laughs) in for a three hour Babylon film. (laughs) So took them there. And it was, and I had that wonder moment of like, whoa, what is this world that is crazy? It is wild. I'm in a theater. Like all that new novel experience really helped induce that feeling of wonder. See, and that's interesting because people who lose themselves in films or in books, that's an indicator of someone who's also high naturally in absorption. And so you are definitely somebody who is, you know, more wonder prone. And that is one of those great ways because you're cut off from the rest of the distractions of the world. And it really allows you to become absorbed. And and that is the gateway. Absorption is that bridge between this world and the transcendent world. And so that when you become absorbed in any activity, it becomes that that doorway that we can walk through to wonder. Yes. Okay. Talk about absorption too, because I think there's so many, so many touch points, especially with teaching and learning styles needing to be absorbed in something for it to hit the deep learning state versus surface level learning. And then also, you know, with absorption, I'm curious, is absorption, could it correlate to like a theta or alpha brainwave state? So absorption is, it's interesting. So it was first started being researched in particular by a gentleman who wanted to understand why some people were more hypnotizable than others, Akatelgen. And he was seeking to understand that, that element of the, of human nature. And what has now come out of that is that absorption is a little bit sometimes hard to pin down. Some people say absorption might even be sort of hyper-powered curiosity, that it's curiosity that now has just been allowed to go down a specific rabbit hole. Some people say that it is very much aligned with a flow state, and it might be that a flow state is a type of very deep absorption. Of course, if we're in a flow state, you generally won't come out of that to feel awe, but it is a precursor to potentially having an aha moment. But I I find that absorption is the ability for us to lose ourselves in an activity, in a story. People who have a tendency towards high absorption also have sort of, I guess I just describe it as spidey senses. You know, they have that feeling of people being around even though we can't see them. We have that feeling of other people's emotions because we're able to observe them and even put ourselves in the position of other people. 
people in a really effective way. So absorption is sometimes difficult for people to recognize. We want to be careful that we're not confusing absorption with sort of this hedonic information seeking. So we're not going down Twitter rabbit holes or Google rabbit holes trying to find out more and more information. That will actually, that's sort of surface. Absorption is taking deep curiosity, curiosity that is cognitive, that is intellectual, that is for the enjoyment, the joy of, of being curious, and then taking that to a point where we lose ourselves. It sort of seems strange that you have to lose yourself then to find yourself, but that is one of the, the first steps. It seems too in that in that state there's a disconnection or an unawareness of the body. You're so immersed in whatever it is you're looking at and studying and I've definitely had that, you know, with our manifestation work as we're doing research on the back end and learning about different things. I'm like, "Oh my gosh, like and I'm so unaware of what's happening in my body in that specific moment, which you know, if someone is is prone to potential rumination or in self-obsessed thoughts, that breaks them out of that in, in a strong way too. And I think that, you know, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, Mihai Shiksent Mihai, who was the scientist who developed the idea of flow, he talks about that flow, you divert all of your attentional resources to the activity at hand to the point that you don't feel hunger, you don't feel thirst, your, your physical needs disappear in pursuit of these mental and intellectual, these cognitive needs. And so I think that that is a, a wonderful opportunity to short circuit rumination to get us off that that treadmill of, of negative thinking also helps us get off the hedonic treadmill of sort of cycling, looking for, you know, more and more hits of, of some kind of dopamine. And I, I find that it is a, a state that people who are, when we're too, again, when we're too distracted and when we allow distractions to rule our life, it becomes impossible, simply impossible for us to become absorbed. Talk about that sort of dopamine treadmill of sorts as well and what's happening in the brain because the way you described it in the book, I'm like, oh, that is why TikTok in particular is so perfect because you are learning something at a surface amount and you're looking for that hit of dopamine. Like I want to find a new fact, a new piece of information, a new stimuli to take in. And I think it does it really effectively even more so than some of the other social media platforms as well. Yeah. Uh, and I, I have to say, I've managed to stay off TikTok. That probably ages me a little bit, but <laughs> I definitely feel that way on, on Twitter and Insta. There's no question. So when we seek information as animals, there used to be this, it's this idea of a trade-off. It's called exploration, exploitation trade-off. And so we tend to explore for a certain percentage of time, and then we exploit the rest. So it tends to be the exploration is, is the smaller period of time, and then the exploitation, so about 20 to 80%. So we're exploring 20% of the time, and then we exploit what we've learned during the rest of it. But as humans, we don't necessarily have to engage in this exploration, exploitation trade-off. We can explore just for the joy of it. But the challenge is, is that it creates this, as you said, this dopamine feedback loop. Our brain wants us to find new information. And so we go out to seek it. Our brain is giving us this, this drive to pursue this information. And when we get it, we are rewarded. So it get, gives us that little bump. But the problem is, is that then we want to continue to explore and then find the resolution and explore and find the resolution. And that becomes sort of this additive, almost, you know, frenzied desire for more and more little nuggets of information. But that sort of curiosity does not allow us to become absorbed. We sort of just stay in that moment of cyclical information seeking. And there's no question that all of the tech moguls know about this science. They're absolutely trying to get us to do that. And the research is also very clear that we are more interested and desirous of seeking information that is controversial. And so they want to feed us stuff that is controversial, that that gets us excited and interested, but in frequently a negative way. I mean, I talk about an experiment in the book where people actually, they were given stacks of cards, one side with pictures of rocks that weren't very 
very interesting, but the other side with pictures of of dog poop. And they actually enjoy turning the cards over to get the ew of the dog poop. Like they people were were motivated to find things that were unpleasant. And so our brains will, whether it's good for us or bad for us, our brains will constantly seek that next hit. And so what we really have to do is sort of step off that that treadmill of information gathering and instead allow us to go deeper, to look for the connecting points, to look for the the cognitive enjoyment of learning, as opposed to sort of those those little nuggets that we're collecting along the way that are just giving us those boosts of endorphins and dopamine. I I think it's so interesting just knowing people have such a hard time getting off of their phones and, and really having compassion almost for yourself. My brain is getting the reward. I understand why this feels good and why this is difficult. And at the same time, how can I put parameters around it to step off this treadmill? I see it as sort of junk food. Like we all have the things that we like and we're allowed to have those. You know, I indulge in some reality TV. You know, that is not helping me get any closer to wonder, I can tell you. But sometimes we just need it. Our brains want that break. The problem is, is that when we become too habituated to that and that becomes our go-to for any kind of relaxation, for any kind of boredom, it becomes a default that our brain just sees that as the place that we go, as opposed to seeking more deep connection, interaction, exploration, which is where we find wonder. So I'm quickly interrupting this episode to invite you if you're ready to start your manifestation journey, or if anything you've heard in our manifestation episodes has piqued your interest to begin. We have a la carte workshops in everything from the basics bundle, which is what we recommend to everyone who starts. It's the formula that actually teaches you how to manifest, unblocked inner child, and unblocked shadow. We also have a la carte workshops on love and money. But the real gem is the Pathway membership because it encompasses every single workshop we have. It's a year-long membership with full access to the few a la carte offerings we have and exclusive workshops not available anywhere else, such as the daily practice, which is what everybody in the Pathway uses, hopefully at least three times a week to daily in order to truly create the new neural pathways that one needs in order to manifest and houses the library of our deep imaginings, which is our unique hypnosis process that allows you to get into your subconscious and overwrite those old neural pathways, creating the new ones. You can use our special code EXPANDED, all caps, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D, to receive $20 off your first a la carte workshop purchase or $20 off your first month of the pathway. Again, that's all caps, EXPANDED, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D. Okay, now back to the episode. Talk a little bit about schema, defining schema, understanding schema, and and also how those sort of fixed beliefs and systems that, and associations that are in there can shift over time and what's sort of required to, to shift them. So schema are just basically the building blocks that create our understanding of the world. And when you're little... When you're a child, you have very few schema. And we can see like babies are little wonder machines, right? We look at their faces and they're just absorbing everything all the time. And as they learn, what we can do is we either assimilate information or we accommodate it. And so I'll use the example of a child who looks at a fruit bowl, right? So they maybe know what an apple is and they look in a fruit bowl and they see a pomegranate and they go, okay, well, it's red, it's round, it's in the fruit bowl. They would assume then that that is an apple. But once they learn that that is not an apple, it's a pomegranate, they're different fruits, that information then can be assimilated into 
the person's understanding of what are different fruits. And if that information is big enough and new enough that it actually creates what's known as accommodation, where we create a whole new schema. So in that case, that little human's fruit schema has enlarged. But if we find some other piece of information to add to that, then there's another schema and that becomes our building blocks. Now, of course, by the time we're adults, we have a lot of schema and it becomes more complex to change them. So the the information gap that we seek to close needs to be that much greater. Otherwise, we will just assimilate the information. We'll assume we understand where it sits within our concept of the world and we'll very quickly, we'll frequently, people will very quickly sort of shut down that information and go, okay, it fits there and then move on. That's how our brains want to operate. But if we are, one, more open, if we tend to be lower in what's known as need for cognitive closure, so we don't feel the need to immediately come to a state of knowing and fully understanding, if we can hold that state of unknowing for longer, then we are more likely to be willing to change our schema. And then in turn, as we have experiences of wonder, of awe, that information gap when it be, when it closes actually creates a new concept of how we see the world. And so it becomes a new lens. And I love the idea of that, that our brain is always changing. I find that oddly comforting, that we are always changing, always evolving. And in that, I find a lot of hope and positivity. I think the key is allowing ourselves to not feel the need to close down our understanding really quickly and to sort of marinate in the things we don't fully understand and to really enjoy that state of not understanding. And that, I believe, allows our brains to get out of the need to assimilate and instead accommodate and create new schema and therefore create new ways of seeing the world. One of the other big pillars in the manifestation process we teach is about like unblocking limiting beliefs, reprogramming them, basically taking whatever the belief and schema system was when you were a child of I'm not good enough because, you know, dad can't play with me after work to, well, what are the other options? Maybe as a kid, that was sort of the black and white belief that we cemented. But now as an adult, can we take a peek back at that and say, oh, he was really exhausted with work. That had nothing to do with whether I was good enough as a kid. And I can actually see all the ways in my adult life that I am good enough and how I'm loved and respected, you know, amongst my peers and and change that schema. In terms of neuroplasticity of this changing, how do we increase the odds of allowing sort of this malleability of these ideas to shift? There is a great way of describing the way our brains operate from neural pathways. So our personality, think of it as sort of a ski slope. And our personality, by the time we're about 25, has made the topography of the ski slope, right? Whether there's rocks, whether there's certain trees that we have to move around. But over time, we create the path that we take down that slope. The challenge is, is that once we've taken the path just even a few times, we naturally want to keep going down that path. So the example of the path is I'm not loved, I wasn't wanted enough, and we can start going down that path. It becomes very hard to jump out of it. But the way that we can jump out of that is through harnessing moments of neuroplasticity. And there are a lot of different ways to do that. We can do that through novelty. Novelty absolutely helps our brain stay more plastic. Simple things like wearing your watch on a different arm or brushing your teeth with a different hand, anything that gets us out of the the typical way of being, taking a different route to work, any way that we can try to see the world with new eyes. And then of course, moments of awe absolutely create a moment of malleability. And in fact, it's why psychedelic therapy is so successful. Psychedelic being a massive expectation violation and a a massive moment of awe, of that wow and woe of awe. And then that malleability that follows is the opportunity to change your perspective. And it's so great that, you know, it helps people who have existential depression, who have, you know, really almost intractable levels of drug addiction. And I mean, these are really big types of, uh, of changes. Now, I'm not suggesting to, to any listeners that they go out and, and experiment with psychedelics, but I think that we can create similar experiences 
seeking really wonder-filled environments and wonderful experiences, and that that does create a level of psychic ma- malleability afterwards that we can fill with whatever we choose to. It's such a spiritual conversation at the same time, too, because it's really tapping into those moments of interconnectedness, wholeness, connected to a greater destiny, a grander thing that's beyond the self. And I think in those moments, that's where we can really see massive, like you were saying in the beginning, massive change in the world, change in the individual, changes human society, et cetera. And it's interesting because it feels like when you have those moments you do feel like you're, you know, it's its own religion of sorts. You're tapping into this thing where you're like, oh, everything's okay and so much bigger than I could even wrap my head around. And I have to be humbled in this experience because it's so much greater than I could even try to contextualize. I think that one of the biggest benefits of wonder is exactly what you're you're describing, what's known in the psychological literature as small self. So this idea that we recognize that we are only just a small component piece of a huge constellation that occurs outside in the world. And of course, when we're going through really difficult times in our life, when we become ruminating, when we are focused on the wrong things, we can become very self-focused. And the benefit of wonder is that it helps us see that we are smaller. It actually makes our problems feel smaller. And it helps us connect to other people because we recognize that we are just one star in that you know galaxy. And I think that that's a really powerful benefit. It also helps us focus in a way that perhaps we hadn't before about the needs of others and that, that pro-sociality. Talk a little bit about perception too, and that being sort of contextual. And I think of perception, you know, the key to communication in any relationship really goes down to accepting that perception is based off of the eye of the beholder, the experience of the beholder, and that there are two things happening at once. So many times communication slips up between people because they are assuming there's the one truth, you don't understand my truth, and it's actually two. So talk a little bit about that and how you touch on it in the book as well. The interesting element of perception, it sort of touches on some of the things we've talked about before that that it's recognizing that our view of the world is not the only one. And when we have an experience that gives us that small self, then we do have a different perception and perspective. But of course, part of perception is recognizing the changes, the differences, and we really only start to see that. And I think one of the challenges in relationships also is that we stop seeing the person for who they actually are, and we see them for the perception of who we've created them to be. And to your point that we're always evolving, if we occupy too much space in our own, you know, us as as the ego, occupy too much space in our own brains, then that doesn't leave enough space for other people and our perception of other people to change. And so I think that that's sort of the perception element in this world, we'll say on this side of the veil. But then, of course, there is the perception of, of what is more, of what is unseen. And I think some people are better able to perceive these other ways of thinking, these other states of being, and that when we're able to tap into that perception, it becomes a really powerful mechanism for connecting to an understanding of our own brains and minds, but also with others. So if someone has a higher need for cognitive closure, they're going to more likely see things as black and white then. Correct. So then how would someone who might have that need or recognize like, oh, wow, I do feel like I'm pretty rigid in my belief systems or being open to new ideas, thus making it harder for me to perceive that, you know, this other person could have a different perception of this situation. What tips or insights or thoughts you have around there? So need for cognitive closure, a combination of, so uh, there's need for cognitive closure and there's need for cognition. These don't sit on a single scale, but it tends to be the people that are higher in need for cognition, who enjoy intellectual pursuits, who like a, a philosophical debate, tend to be much lower in need for cognitive closure. So they're happy to sit in the unknowing. And then the v- reverse is true. People who really need quick answers and need to shut down and say, this is the answer. I have the single right answer. 
then they tend to be lower in need for cognition. So they don't want to seek more information because that will only confuse and muddle the answer that they've come to. The positive thing is that that's actually quite changeable. Unlike our, our personality traits, we can engage in activities that will increase our need for cognition and decrease our need for cognitive closure. One of the great ways to do that is to simply engage with people that are different from ourselves and try to have conversations with them. I mean, it seems really simple, but that does start to help our brains expand and helps us to connect to other people. Other ways to reduce our need for cognitive closure is, again, to allow ourselves to sit in a state of unknowing. Do not feel the need to rush to a solution. Allow yourself to, to say, I don't know, and sit in that for a while rather than having to assume that you do. And I think that it becomes quite difficult, especially for people who are in you know important jobs, in, in roles with a, a lot of responsibility, tend to find a certain amount of comfort in that need for cognitive closure. They're like, okay, I have this figured out. But I think it really will help us if we can allow ourselves to stay in a state of unknowing. Now, one of the challenges that goes against that is our schooling systems tend to really over-index on having that one right answer. And if you raise a child believing that they're going to be measured based on certain tests that are have the single right answer, then they will grow up only seeking that, only seeking to fulfill that one information need, as opposed to seeking a lot of different opinions and being willing to sit in that unknowing. When I was reading that section two on schooling, I was like, okay, if you have your kids in standard school, you have to have a philosophical debate with them about things at home. You know, try to at least open their minds to something more, more of a discourse than just right, wrong, right, wrong, you know, check whatever A or F, you know, on their test. It's like, well, what are the other options here? And I think even you touch on in the book, the schooling system in general, having, you know, the schooling system as it is very focused for maybe a certain type of learning, but people who are more neurodivergent, it doesn't really reinforce their intellect and and how smart they are. My fiance's therapist had said that by the time neurodivergent kids are like 11, they would have heard like 7,000 bits of negative information about their intelligence and who they are than other kids. Just because of the system and schooling works in a way that operates for a certain brain type versus another, which I think is just so fascinating. I believe that the school systems do not serve certainly don't serve everyone, but I I actually think that we are in many school systems losing the wonder when, you know, funding is based on how everybody scores on particular standardized tests. And that doesn't allow for nuance. It doesn't allow for gray. Everything becomes black and white. And I think that for, for people who, especially for children where they can't even see that way, they do see everything as nuanced. They do see a constellation of colors that becomes almost impossible for them to learn. And I, I think that as to your point, the way that parents engage with children, talking to them, asking them questions, museums are incredible wonder labs, getting your kids to museums, challenging them, challenging them even on the single right answer to say, okay, I know that's what you learned and that's what you'll, that's what you'll regurgitate because that will get you the score, but let's really dig deeper. Let's talk a little bit more about how that maybe could that be a little bit wrong? And if that was, why might that be? And how do we open ourselves up to these different possibilities? And I think that the school systems, some are great, but I think that many are just overwhelmed and strapped. And in that, there does not allow a lot of opportunity for wonder. But the data is so clear that wonder-based learning, it creates long-term recall of that information. You know, if you're shoving stuff in only to regurgitate for the single right answer, you will generally not remember that. You won't recall that. Whereas if it is something that occurs from deep learning, from true curiosity, then an expectation violation where what we thought would happen doesn't, and then we learn something new, that sticks in our brains. That really creates a new neural pathways. A hundred percent. I even think about, you know, I I went to school for film and television and learning some of the techniques and the processes there were, you know, a lot of times, okay, you learn this thing and then you apply it on the test. And then 
when I got in the real world and had to edit a sizzle reel really quickly for my internship or, you know, my new job, I learned a lot faster and was way more immersed because I'm having real-time feedback with real-time stakes. And I always think back, I feel like my most beneficial thing I learned from college was maybe more social interaction than the actual raw data and information. It's more life experience in my case, at least specifically for what I went to school with. Obviously, if you're studying to be a doctor, that's very different. But I just think about that too. And 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 schooling, I guess, in the modern day and depending upon what people's careers are. I mean, you've even said people have, what is it, 17 different jobs by a certain age point. That's wild. 17 jobs in five industries. So we need to be really adept at at learning and unlearning as quickly as possible. And that idea of unlearning, again, we need to be able to move out of those ruts, those neural pathways, take different routes down that that ski slope of our of our thinking, which leads to our behavior. And again, to your sort of one of your first questions about, well, how do we how do we create that opportunity for openness. And really, it's this idea, it's an old phrase that says, you know, neurons that fire together, wire together. The more that we do something, even if it feels unnatural to us, eventually our brain will catch up. And so if there are activities that we want to engage in, if we want to be more open, if we want to be more curious, first you sort of just fake it. You know, you just engage in that behavior and eventually your brain will will catch up. And I think that that's a great opportunity. And obviously, you know, you saw that when you left school that you were saying, okay, that's that behavior is not going to help me. I need to learn a different way. Absolutely. We've talked about it in this podcast and on other episodes, but this idea that time kind of slows down and freezes when we're having those terrifying moments, especially in traumatic moments. Obviously, it happens during transcendent moments. It's happening during our awe-inspiring moments. Talk a bit about why it slows down or why it feel appears to slow down and why we in a lot of cultures have this sense that time is sped up and we have no time, no abundance of time. It's we're we're running out of time. We don't have enough time in the day. You know, what is the two sensations and how do we slow it down a bit? So it is fascinating. By pure metrics, we do have a lot more time than we ever did, you know, between technology and the freedom of the way that we work, the relative wealth levels um, that people experience, we have a lot more time, but we are filling it with so much other stuff. And that is a conscious choice. Also, as we um, start to equate time and money, then we start to feel even more time poor because we feel that there is a trade-off that we're while we're doing this other thing, we could be making more money. And so I think some of it comes back to a little bit of a consumerist drive as well. But it's fascinating. So we think that we observe and take in a lot more information than we actually do. Our brain cannot possibly remember everything that we experience. There's just too much. There's too much stimuli. And so it filters based on what it thinks is important. So when we're just going through our day-to-day life, we're maybe laying down, we'll say, you know, 10 memories per minute, maybe even 10 memories if we reflect back on it per hour. But when we go through something that is particularly terrifying or awe-inspiring or dramatic, what's happening is there was a belief that maybe our brains were speeding up and processing information more quickly, but actually what it is is we're just laying down more memories. So I like to think of it as a flip book. So it's this idea that if it's not important, there's only a few pages to the flip book, it goes quickly. But if it's something that is dramatic, then our brain says, oh, we got to pay attention to this. And it lays down a lot more memories in that flip book of our mind. So when we go back to experience it in our memory, it feels much more intense. We feel like we have so much more detail. And in that, then it becomes a a fascinating opportunity, of course, to examine that moment in, in greater detail. What I've, I found really interesting from the research is that Also, people who experience awe then feel that time slows down, but even if it's little bits of awe will help us feel that we have more time. And that's, I think, a really fascinating piece of research around that if we are given that additional time, also what we will do with that time. So we are then more open to experiential learning, to engaging sometimes in in more pro-social activities, so helping, volunteering, things like that. And so it becomes this additive benefit that if we allow ourselves 
to make the time for wonder that it will actually make us feel that we have more time that then makes us want to pursue more wonder. So it's another one of those sort of positive cyclical wonder moments. Well, yeah. And I even think too, you know, one thing I try to do is go out on the balcony or my roof where I live and watch the sunset. And that seems to, especially if I'm like, oh no, I can't go out and do it. I have so many things I have to get done. I don't have the time. I don't have the time. And I'm always, you know, I'm not always perfect about it, but I'm like, no, if I go out, it will give me clear cognition to finish whatever I need to finish in probably a faster amount of time, even though I took time away to go see the sunset. And probably also, like you were saying before, physiologically, like lowers the cortisol levels, lowers the stress hormones. You know, I'm not in a frantic state completing the rest of my work because I wanted to get to the sunset. No, I go take, see the sunset, have my awe-inspiring moment, and then everything kind of melts a little bit wider after. That experience will make you feel less rushed when you were returning to that work, a a lesser degree of urgency. The research behind it really is fascinating. The way that we capture memories, the way that we perceive time. And again, to your earlier question around perception, I mean, time is the, the perfect example that time is only perception to the person who is experiencing it and that we have the opportunity to affect that perception through the use of of wonder and through the use of awe. I mean, that is just so cool to think about. Like I have so many friends and, and family that always say like, I don't have time. I don't have time to do that. I don't have time to do that. It's like make time for the wonder moments and then you will have time to do it. That is just so powerful. Yeah. And I think, and I feel like this is the point where I have to say that, um, that there are some people who really do not, who are time poor. And I think that there are structural issues in the world that mean that some people's path to experiencing wonder is not as unencumbered as others. So obviously if you are working two jobs and a single parent, you probably really don't feel like you have a lot of time for wonder. You know, that's a structural issue, but I would say that that most people if they allow themselves just even a 5-minute wonder break or a 10-minute wonder walk will come back feeling that they are more able to manage the time pressures whether they're real or perceived. So powerful. Well, we're about to wrap up here. So tell us about, I know, speaking of time, I'm like, I feel like (laughs) it was two minutes long. It was so fast. (laughs) So tell us about the book. Where can they find it? Where can people connect with you, find more and, and all of that? So the book is called The Power of Wonder. You can buy it anywhere that you buy books and it is uh, available globally. So wherever people might be listening and it comes out on the 21st of February, I hope that everybody enjoys it. And um, you can find out more information at monica-parker.com. And that's all information about me, how we're applying wonder at work and how we can find more wonder. Lots of little tidbits that you can find, tips on taking a wonder walk, all of that. So there's sort of a treasure trove of information on that site. Awesome. Thank you so much, Monica. And thank you so much for the work that you're putting out into the world. It's so necessary, so powerful and yeah, very, very important stuff. Thank you so much for having me, Jessica. It was really, it was a, it was a wonderful time. Thank you so much for tuning into the episode and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, we did. And in case you're not totally ready to join the pathway yet, I wanted to share a few of our free offerings that I'll often suggest to people as a little bit of a blueprint to get them started on their manifestation journey. The first place I like to direct people completely for free is the motivation. You can see it linked below or on our homepage as our testimony library. And it's categorized by different subjects, whether you're calling in career, money, love, wellness, and much more. When you're reading about a member's experience of what they manifested, you're actually seeing to believe and showing your subconscious that that very thing is possible for you. The second place I like to direct people is to the free clarity exercise, which is also linked below. In it, you get to try our own unique hypnosis process, learn about the science and some journaling prompts. And the best part about this, you'll get a tiny taste of what it's like to go into your hypnotic state, bring your subconscious forward and create new neural pathways while receiving clarity. 
And the third thing, if you haven't listened to it on this podcast yet, please go back to the episode titled Manifestation 101, where you'll learn the basics of neural manifestation to truly understand this process. So go ahead and check out those free resources, the motivation, the free clarity exercise, and the episode Manifestation 101, all linked below. And in an effort to make sure to have representation in this process series, go ahead and submit any process testimonials you have, especially to our LGBTQ plus community, our BIPOC, as well as the WISE, which is anyone in the community who is 45 and over. All right, we'll be back next week. Mm-hmm.